you have already proposed in your heart that our lives will be for glory. And so, Lord, we thank you for your eternal counsel. We thank you for your thoughts toward us that are not of evil but of good to bring us to that expected end. We thank you for the beauty that you have already deposited in, in us that by the hand of your Holy Spirit and through our obedience you are bringing out on the daily basis. Father, we worship your holy name. us his beloved. Let us call his name. Oh, let us call his name. Yes, yes you are. Yes, you are. Today we submit in all humility to the truth that your word is above all else, that your name is higher than all names. And we bring to that submission today every mountain that we have exalted by reason of fear. We bring them low before you today because we know that you are the Lord and there is none besides you. There is none greater than you. None even compares with you. None compares to you, Lord, you are great. There is no one like you, you will love. And we submit to your greatness today, Lord. Be glorified in every heart tonight, Lord. Let your name ring true in all of our hearts. Be magnified, Lord. Great Worship his holy name. Bow before him, my faith. Bow before him because you believe. And he will reward. He will reward. He will reward. My brother said, I am a man, dear Bosa. I command the yellow man, my brother. It's the kingdom yours, it's the power yours, it's the glory forever. It's the power. Yo, 
God is good. Hallelujah. Y'all be seated. Praise the Lord. Let us all be seated. God is good. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Wow, we thank God and we thank God for these guys. That was phenomenal. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. God is good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Holy Ghost. Man. I um <laughs> I would like to uh, remind us that we are still meant to be meant to be applying the concept of right to left and left to right. So um for the benefit of those who may be hearing that for the very first time and um, and for those who need to just hear it again, there are things that we see in the Word of God that we have become familiar with in a particular sense. And I, I said it on the day that I first introduced you to the concept that the original languages that the Bible and Scripture in general the original languages that they were written in. You know, I heard somebody just say that I would love to worship God like this in my closet. And I see you. And I, and I declare over you today because the office of a prophet differs from the office of a seer Largely because a seer says what he sees, but a prophet sees what he says. And so I am thankful that we have that privilege in the body of Christ. And so I say over you today, woman of God, that you will experience tangible, tangible measures of the presence of God in your home when you pray on your own when you're just there thinking to yourself oh i remember this song the lord will have me say to you today that now that the word has been spoken it says now that my prophet has declared over you it is not you remembering it is i bringing it to your remembrance so don't take it lightly when you think you have just remembered a song press into it the lord brings to you songs that will bring you to the place where you will hear more in the mighty name of jesus the original languages that the Bible was written in were languages written from left, from right to left. Because the theory goes, most of those places are somewhat in the east. And the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. So it goes from east to west. But when civilization, or what you would call literacy, got to the west, the West started to write from left to right. Isn't that how we write? We write mostly from left to right. And so I have come to know that because God is the beginning and the end and that the Elohim is the author of cultures, traditions, and languages, I have come to know that it was part of God's intention 
to provide a more elaborate understanding of scripture when we can identify portions that have to be read in the palindrome, read from left to right. I call it the palindrome because it is still the truth regardless. And for those people who may have forgotten, a palindrome is a word that reads the same from left to right or from right to left. Right? Can somebody think of one of, one of such words? Well, by this shall all men know that she was a teacher. Because you have to be a school teacher to just go race car. Now that's, yeah. I was thinking of words like, you know, minim. Yeah, like, like Hannah, you know, yeah. You know, like minim, but she just went race car. Wow. Okay, we'll take it. A race car is still race car whether you read it from left to right or from right to left. That is what a palindrome is. The word of God is a palindrome even though you read it from left to right with a different meaning and then reading it from right to left having a different meaning. The meaning that you deduce from the word of God is meant to instruct you on how to posture yourself. It doesn't change that word. Because that word is the truth. And it is infallible. You cannot doctor it. You cannot change it. You cannot question it. You ask questions about it to know it, but you cannot question what it says. But for your benefit, it is important for you to have that balanced understanding. You see, the word, there's a scripture that commands anyone who is able to rightly divide the word of truth. The expression rightly dividing the word of truth was an expression that I believe was used because when the truth was first documented as scripture, it was not written with any vowel sounds. The ancient languages in which the Bible was written were mostly consonant sounds. And so in order for you to be able to insert the vowels where they need to go, you must know the words that you're dealing with. Because if you put the vowel in the wrong place, the meaning suddenly changes. You understand what I mean? And so, when you think about it, as men and women of God, it is important for us to know the truth of the Word of God, and by so doing, we would have the liberty of expression. Because there are instances wherein you begin from right to left, and other times you go from left to right. And I gave you a couple of examples the other day, and I'll give you another example today. You understand what I mean? Because it is important for us to take these examples to get the adequate understanding so that we can apply the principle. But before I give you an example, I'm going to tell you the reason why I am saying it today. In fact, that reason itself is an example. Do you know that many of us, when we are watching one of our favorite teams play, and they happen to be winning, something that people from Atlanta may not know too much about, but it's okay because the people watching online may be from Atlanta, but for those of us here, we're from Zion. Come on. And in Zion, that is all we know. We just know victory all day long. Yeah, I got out of that one because I saw the way Alan folded his arms like, you're gonna, are you planning to come out of here today? I'll be at the door. <laughs> when our favorite teams are winning and they're scoring those points, what do we do? We shout. We shout for excitement because we have seen victory. Do you know that if you want your team to win, you don't have to wait until they start winning before you shout. So reading from right to left means we wait until we get here before we shout. But if I know that shouting is part of the equation of winning, 
that I can actually begin shouting before we start winning so that I have fulfilled the condition for victory. Imagine if the children of Israel had walked up to the wall of Jericho and angel Michael comes and says, hold up, hold up, hold up, everybody. I'm about to show you what I can do. Imagine if he had kicked down the walls of Jericho. The people would have shouted, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. But guess what God did? God allowed them to shout first before the walls fell down. My challenge to you today is what have you read from the word of God from left to right that you need to go ahead and read from right to left. When the Lord says to you that I will be with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. So don't wait until you are feeling the life of God before you recognize the person of God. Even when you're feeling the opposite of life, when you are in the valley of the shadow of death, what do you do? Acknowledge the one who says to you that he will always be with you. Because by acknowledging life in the midst of death removes death from the equation. Because you cannot acknowledge, <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, let me tell you the secret behind acknowledging who God is and what God says about himself. You see, the moment you can acknowledge that God is who he says he is, then he becomes in your instance. And God said it this way, and quite often, because we have heard it over and over again, we just gloss over it. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And so if I'm in a situation that appears to be dark, I have critical decisions to make and it seems like I am confused and I am unsure because I just don't feel like I have enough light to make a move. What do I do? I seek out the light. Because when there is darkness, the antidote is what? Light. And so if God is light and I need light, what do I do? I begin to praise him as the light. The moment I create that atmosphere of praise, it becomes the presence of God. Now, we used to think that praise invites the presence of God. How many people ever thought like that? My hand is up too. I used to think that if I praise God enough, it can evoke the presence of God. But the Bible did not say that God visits the praises of his people. <laughs> the Bible says God inhabits the praises of the people. So the praise does not invite him to come. An atmosphere of praise is the atmosphere of God's presence. So let, let's say that again because of Mary Ann. You see, and I said Mary Ann because she looked like she was still meditating on it. When you say, <laughs> great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Remember who said it before you did, and why he said it. It was David who said it. He said, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. It is beautiful for elevation. It is the joy of the whole earth. He was talking about the fact of just magnifying his name and saying his name is greatly to be praised is actually the city where he dwells. So it's not like he comes into that praise. Once you start to praise him, what you're doing is you begin to construct piece by piece the atmosphere of his presence. So it doesn't just appear, it gets revealed. Remember that we have moved into another gear. You see what I mean? And now the Lord said to me very expressly, why? <laughs> okay, we will get to the why, but let me tell you the how. 
that we need to comport ourselves in this new season that we're in. You see, when, the, when God brings a man or a people to where he's brought communion house to you, he does so not because of your efforts. He does so because it is his pleasure. The Bible says, be kind or be good in your goodness to Zion because of your pleasure. And when God decides to be merciful unto a people, and the Lord decides, decides to promote a people and to allow for the gates to open because he has put his glory on their faces, God has one expectation of such a people. And we know that because that was exactly what he expected of Adam when he brought him into the garden of his pleasure. When God situated Adam in Eden, God had one ask. He says, have dominion. You see, God does not want to bring you to a place that you cannot dominate. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And that is the reason why when God looks at you and all of the things that you are asking for and pointing to, <laughs> he smiles and he can tell that you're, you may not, you're not ready because he doesn't want to bring you there and have you dominated. Because there are forces that are looking forward always to call God out. Those ancient voices that keep saying, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you would visit him. And God is looking for people like Job that God can boast in. People that God knows that when I bring them to a particular territory, they would not begin to cower like as though they are grasshoppers in the sight of the outgoing inhabitants. Let me tell you something, when they were standing in my face, they might have appeared as giants. But because the Lord has driven them out in front of me, their stature continues to diminish until they vanish. And so I tell you today that the elements of my speech today and my delivery as an oracle of God is to inspire within you the confidence with which to wield the authority of dominion. To begin to speak with another voice because you have become another being. You see, because it is very customary for us as human beings to carry with us a tape recorder everywhere we go that continues to play the same voices that we recorded when we still did not have understanding. But the Lord is saying, let us put all things behind us, like Paul says. He says, I count every one of those things now as losses, and I put them behind me because now I have attained a new stature, and it has to show. Because a glory that is not seen <laughs> is the glory lost. Jesus says, let it shine. Men need to see what we have done in you. They need to see what we have deposited on the inside of you. It needs to shine. It needs to show. You need to unveil yourself as you get to the doors and to the gates so that they may know. I remember this song that says, Hear me, O spirits of darkness, so that you may know where I stand, simply because I am not here to window shop. I am here to possess. We might as well be called the race car generation. <laughs> because every time you change the gear of a race car, it makes a different kind of sound. Look at that, and she's like, yeah. <laughs> she was like, yeah. I tell you what, the sound that we make is important. You see, I, I, I kind of, we, praise the Lord, gave you an insight on Saturday into how to operate in this new season. 
We have left the season of being just men. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, quit being just a man. Don't be just human when you can be more. And on Saturday, what did I tell us? I told us that we have to recognize the beings that are present around the throne of God. Because we are those beings around the presence of God. The Bible says that we are the children around his table. In the presence of God, what is there? Fullness of joy. What is joy? You are his joy. When Jesus was born, what, was his, what, was, what did the angels call him? They said joy to the world. So when you look at that scripture that says in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there is, he's got pleasures forevermore. You are his pleasure. You are his joy. So whenever you see or hear of anything that is found in the presence of God, that is another manifestation of the glory of God in your existence. So when I introduced us to that concept on Saturday, it was almost like it slipped out of my mouth because I wouldn't say that we had come to that point just yet and that was why I said we're going to teach on these things. But it slipped out and I'm glad that it did because I had to give myself away as one who had seen through the eyes of the four living creatures. The four living creatures are said to have eyes all around them. You see, because you can only function in a dimension that you can see. Let me say that again. You cannot, heaven, see, God, the creator, created the multiple dimensions of consciousness and existence and of power with so much intentionality that you cannot accidentally begin to reign in a dimension that you're not even aware of. Yeah, the Bible says reigning is for kings and kings the word king is the opposite of the word unknown men. So people who haven't discovered themselves are called unknown men. But the people who know who they are in Christ Jesus, they realize that they are kings. Do you get it? But for you to be a king, you have to have a domain. You can't just say that I am a king. You know, we find a lot of people who say, oh, I'm a king, I'm a queen. And I'm like, okay, bless your heart. But where is your kingdom? Because if, you are, if you're ruling, you must be ruling somewhere. You understand what I mean? Yeah, you have to be ruling somewhere if you are a king because we can't just keep throwing words around. That's not how it works. That is not how this works. You have to know the domain that you're ruling over. And here is how it works. There are dimensions of human existence and there are dimensions of angelic existence. And the interesting thing about us is that we are not limited when it comes to the various dimensions of existence. In fact, if anything at all, it is the joy of your heavenly father to see you operate as a multi-dimensional being. And I'm going to and I'm going to prove it to you. You see, remember in the book of Revelations, toward the end of Revelations when John was done writing down the things that he saw, he wanted to close the book. And the angel of the Lord who was with him, who had been with him, because it was the same angel who had been showing him, but that angel continued to transform or to be transformed in the face of John because that angel went from glory to glory. And the Bible says the glory of the latter shall surpass the former. So the first time John saw the angel of the Lord, he was able to compose himself somewhat, but when that angel's assignment was complete, he had to give John a final show 
So he showed himself in another level of glory. And the Bible says the man of God, John, fell out. He couldn't take it anymore. He fell to his face and he worshipped because the glory was so much like the glory of the Son of God that John thought that he once again had seen the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said to him, you will do no such thing because I am a man just like you. <laughs> he didn't say that just because genetically or by configuration he was a man. No, that's not the reason why he said it. He said it because by his lineage, he was in fact a Jewish man like John. So he said to him, I'm not saying that I'm a man just because I'm humanoid. I have the form of a man. I am saying I'm a man because I share the same lineage as you. I have only ascended. You see, let me, let, let's, let's dial back one step so that we can fire forward many more steps. You see, I, I shared with you once before what I personally believe, okay? And I'm going to say to you again that I believe that that was Daniel. Because what he said to John was simple. He said to John, he says, don't close the book. Why would he say that? Because when Daniel wrote a lot of what? The revelation of John comprised, I mean, is comprised of, when he wrote it, he wrote it because angel Gabriel came to him. And the meaning of Gabriel means man of God. Because you think about Gabriel, and most of us will think about this angel with wings, who is made out of fire, who just levitates, whose feet don't touch the ground. But the Bible says his name is Gabriel, which means a man of God. The Bible, not, his name is not angel of God. His name is man of God. <laughs> you see, there are men and there are men. The problem with us and the reason why it appears as though we are powerless in the face of various situations is because some of those situations are controlled from a dimension where you're not recognized yet. You understand what I mean? So let's go back to this same Daniel. Daniel received the revelation from Gabriel. And Gabriel said to him, you can close the books because it's not going to be for a, it's, it's going to be a little while before it happens. And then when he showed it to John, he knew what he was told and he was counting the time. And he knew that, okay, it's no longer going to take so much time. Longer, because when I saw it 960 years ago, I think it was about 490 years before, they told me that it was going to be in just a little while. And now I am revealing it to you, and we see the Son of Man is already on the way. There's no point sealing the book. That was clue number one. And then he went on to say to him, he says, I am a man just like you. I am a prophet of your people. I am of your kindred. If you look at the chronology, if you look at the chronicles or the genealogy of your people, you will find my name in the genealogy of your people. And this is the final straw for me. This is the final conclusion because the name Daniel means God is my judge. And the name John means the judgment of God. Because the judgment that we received is the grace of God. It started with an announcement that a judgment is coming. And it ended with the conclusion that that judgment is grace. But whether that man is Daniel or not, one thing that we do know is that that was a man. Did something happen to my background music? I can't hear it anymore. Okay, it's back now. Praise God. You see, the prophetic is very much in tune with the minstrel. And I look forward to the time once again wherein we would have a minstrel like Danny Newlands. And many people remember in the days that Daniel will play the guitar for four hours and I will prophesy for four hours and two minutes. 
simply because you know there is a there is a gifting in the in the minstrel world that allows for one to be able to aid the prophetic and allow for it to happen with much ease. You understand what I mean? But I am thankful because I have gone for so long without a dedicated minstrel. And what that has taught me is it has taught me to be a root out of a dry ground. And so just imagine what happens when my minstrel comes again. I am looking forward to the flavor and the dimension of prophecy that will begin to flow. And, and that minstrel is already on the way. Praise the Lord. You see, can I, teach you, can I teach you a principle? Can I teach you something? The Bible says that the testimony of the Lord Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The what? The testimony of the Lord Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You see, when your heart is dedicated to giving glory to God, to testifying not of your own ability, but to testify of his own goodness, you know what happens is the spirit of unction that delivers the prophetic will not depart from you. As soon as I was talking about the prophetic and talking about the minstrel, I was saying those things in honor to the Lord who gave gifts unto men. Not as somebody who has understood some science, but someone who has come to recognize that it is all by the grace of God. As soon as I was telling you, I turned around and behold, I saw the minstrel with his suitcase and he came down from a bus. And it was said to me, your minstrel is already on the way. And you, you will see soon by the grace of God. Hallelujah. The angel that appeared to John was a man who was in and out of heaven, in and out of time. You see, heaven is a place, the earth is a place. They are two different dimensions, and in between them are five dimensions. Because there are seven levels in general. You have seven spirits of God having dominion over each one of the realms. And so when you think about it, okay, those are places. But what about time? Time itself is multidimensional because there is a past, there is a present, and there is a future. And as I'm speaking to you now, we are here in the present. However, because I am called to the office of a prophet, I am given a pass with which to traverse. And that's why sometimes I'm able to say to you the things that the Lord revealed to me concerning you when you were 14, when you were 12, when you were 16. And at the same time, the Lord allows for me to declare things that are about to come simply because dimension of fluidity is my birthright as a prophet of God. It is dimensional fluidity. If I am not traversing dimensions, I am not what God says I am. Because how can I fulfill my office when my office is actually meant to be that of a traversing messenger that goes in and out of dimensions? And you as a child of God, you also are meant to be going in and out of dimensions. Why? Because if you don't know how to go in and out of dimensions, you cannot even provide help to your help. You know, because there are times wherein your help needs help. I don't know how to cook, but my wife does. So when it comes to staying alive in the flesh, She's my hell. Because if you left me to my own devices, I would go for days without eating because the thought of going to boil water just fills me. Whenever I think about going to cook anything, I just become full. Oh yeah, I mean, I've done it before. I've gone for days without eating just because I can't be asked to cook anything. And so when I think about food I, I, and the effort that goes into it, I just become full. I just tell myself, it is better to be without. <laughs> but you know, even though she is my help in that capacity, there are times wherein she needs help. She needs someone to clean up. 
Not just after her, sometimes before her. Because before she comes downstairs to cook, we may have come up with a bright idea, myself and the kids, of some craft we want to make, and then we make a mess of the whole place. And then as soon as we hear, the, I mean, how oh, I nearly said the Lord, as soon as we hear the wife come down, we look at each other and we're like, stop the clock. Freeze time. And let's clean this mess. Because if she comes down and there is a mess, then it's in the way of her ability to help. So my help needs help. Daniel prayed to God and God sent him a messenger. And that messenger fell into the hand of the prince of Persia, a principality over the region. And the prince of Persia was like, the moment this prayer gets in the hand of Daniel, he will change the face of this territory. I may get reassigned. Let me, let me explain to you what I just said, if you haven't thought about it before. You see, the angel of the Lord was coming, and he, he was accosted by a principality. Because principalities are over regions. And that particular region was the region of Persia. And what Daniel was doing, he was holding up the arm of Nebuchadnezzar, as well as the Chaldeans, and they were transforming all of Persia because of this mad genius that was in their court. And so he was already doing great things. He was already breaking barriers, and now heaven is sending him more arsenal, more artillery. Do you know that it didn't even matter to the prince of Persia what was in that prayer? He just knew that Daniel wasn't getting any more resources. That's it. No, it's not happening. You see, because I tell you these things because if you don't know how to look at things through multiple dimensions, you will think of things only in isolation. What happened to Daniel was the same thing that happened to Nehemiah. Nehemiah had favor with the king and they gave him enablement, a letter that's of, that would override the authority of the governor. And the people who saw that Nehemiah was already rising in the courts of the king knew that if he was successful on that particular mission, there would be no stopping Nehemiah. So what did they do? Remember those guys, Sambalat and Tobiah. They were like, they had no problem with Jerusalem's wall being rebuilt. The problem they had was with how powerful Nehemiah was going to become. You know, the devil does not particularly have a problem with the wealth that you will attain, but he has a problem with the person you will become. And so here we are seeing that the prince of Persia, he had a legitimate reason to withstand the angel of the Lord. Because it's like, as the last time I checked, I was still the one assigned to this region and no one said otherwise. So whatever goes on in here has to come through me. And I don't like this one. Many, many a times we don't think about it that way. We, we, we always, we've been told to be in desperate mode all the time. We're always binding and losing, binding and losing. And we don't even know the meaning of binding. You know, you will never find anywhere in scripture where Jesus bound a demon. I'm like, okay, I want to cast out the demon. And the first thing I do is bind it. So if I bind the demon in the sense that we bind, which means to tie the demon, how is it going to go out? So will I have to carry it out? <laughs> what an insult. I'm a king for crying out loud. I mean, I take out the trash at home, but I don't take out people's demons. I cast them out. The Bible says it would speak a word and they will run out. Some of them will jump out, but they would scram. He didn't have to carry them out. But we are like, oh, we have to first of all bind the demon. And then you cast it out. The demon is like, okay, so which one do you want? You want me in incapacitated or out of here? Because I can't do both, as you can see. And so you bind the demon and the demon is like, I know the code. Bind me when you're gone, I'll lose myself. And that is the reason why the same people whose demons you bind on Tuesday, when you see them the next time, they're like, wow, maybe we should have left you as you were. Because what happened was you gave the demon a nap and now it's a stronger demon. For the benefit of those people watching, because I know here at Communion House, we know what it means to bind. 
You know, Jesus told his disciples, he says, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. We all have insurance policies here. And what is the most important document? It's the binder. The binder contains the things that are what? Binding. What binds the insurance company to you? What binds you to them? And what binds you to others? So a binder essentially consists of declarations. And so what Jesus was saying when he says whatsoever you bind, it means whatsoever you put your seal of authority over in the form of a declaration is now being honored by heaven. <laughs> because you cannot obtain a mortgage without an insurance that is binding. So you need that binder. And so what that means is when you present that to the lender, they see that, okay, well, he's got insurance. If anything happens to that home, we will all have money to share. Right? It's a shared interest. When you have your insurance binder and, and you want to get on the road, the dealership is going to say, can we see your insurance before you drive this thing off the lot? And so that is what happens. Heaven is like we have so much blessing in your name. But we can't just release everything without a binder. What have you bound? And so Satan knew that if we remain ignorant, our blessings will remain suspended. And he can continue to torment us because we, we're not nice people when we lack things. It is not very easy to walk in the fruit of the spirit when you do not have things. A person who is very hungry, hungry can be quite angry. You know, there is a fruit of the spirit that is called long suffering. And so people want to suffer long. But then after a while, if somebody offers them something that they haven't seen before, then I forget about suffering long. I am going with this dude. The Lord says, wait until you see the cloud move. And then somebody comes and says, if you follow me, I'll give you $400. And I went, they're like, Jesus, I'll see you later. You see, because of all those material things. And so Satan knows the way that we are wired. And that is the reason why he allows for his little miscreants to go into the world called demons so that we can be using all of our binding on them instead of using our binding on the blessings. When Jesus spelt it out very clearly, he says, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. The moment you present your binder, it unlocks and loosens the things that are held in your name. You see, your blessings are held in your name. Jesus had a blessing that was once held. Do you remember that? When Jesus' blessing was held, what word did he use? He says to his disciples, there is a donkey that I need to ride. Go and loosen. So when your blessings are held, what do you do? You loose them. You're not binding and losing demons. I don't even know how we got there, but it was a good thing that we went there. So now I want to tell you one more thing before I get off. I started by telling you of what it means to go from right to left and from left to right. And the reason why that is important is because it depends on the dimension that you are operating in. Some dimensions have to be accessible to you so that you can complete that which is required for your victory. Daniel's example was such that his prayer hit a particular dimension that released a messenger who was bringing it. And the prince of Persia was like, you're not going through because I'm the principality here. And so the angel was there, stuck. And Daniel, excuse me, would have stayed without his blessing. He had already waited for 21 days. And so what did the man of God do? He started to scan the realm of the spirit. He was scanning, he was tracking his package. Just like you track your package on Amazon. They're like, man, this thing, they said it was dispatched two days ago. And you've gone to the porch 50 times in four minutes. And it's still not there. So what do you do? Do you know that there's no amount of going to the porch that can bring your package? You have to jump dimensions. 
through your computer. You go to another dimension that is called the internet. And then on the internet, you can see where your package is stuck. And then you can give them a call or you can drive there because sometimes your blessings are held at a depot somewhere. You understand what I mean? But if you keep going to the porch, can you see it? No. But if you go through your computer, you can see it. That's a different kind of eye. There is one eye that sees through the window. And there is one window that sees the outside world. But there is also another window. Maybe that's why they call all the rubbish ones windows. I'm mean, sorry, all the other ones I meant to say, windows. Because they let, they let you see into another dimension. Now, I'm going to take four minutes or so to quickly explain this thing because I want us to get to a place where we can begin to act on it as soon as we leave this place. Even before you leave, you can begin to use it. So when you look at what happened in the case of Daniel, he had placed an order, but he was stuck. So what did he do? He went back to see what was going on. And he was able to secure another help from another dimension. Because it wasn't, you remember the angel that was bringing the first blessing? What was the name of that angel? Does anybody know? No. Because there are angels that we hear about all the time whose names we never know. But there is another dimension wherein those angels have names that are worth mentioning. Because they carry such authority, you have to call their names. And so he went to the dimension of the archangels, and one of the archangels came down to see what was going on. Basically, what Michael, what Daniel did was he called for the supervisor. And when Daniel called, Michael answered. And when he answered, he told the prince of Persia, hey, hey, hey he's with us. And that prince of Persia had to open the gate. He wasn't happy, but he delivered. And I'm so glad that I said that because I've always wanted to say that. You see, I'm, I won't dwell on it because this is coming out of my four minutes. Many of us, we want to be happy before we deliver. But your happiness is in your delivery. Many of us want our enemies to be happy with us. And by so doing, maybe they will let us have a fair passage. But the Lord is saying they don't have to be happy with you for them to deliver because I can make them to be at peace with you. You know somebody can be at peace with you and still not like you. They can be at peace with you and still not like you. Have you heard of something called dream visitation? Yeah. So somebody who doesn't like you that wants to hurt you can receive a visitation in a dream wherein the angel of the Lord wants them and say, if you go near Anita again, your fingernails will start falling off. So she still doesn't like Anita, but now she's at peace. Remember that Pontius Pilate was not on Jesus' side, but his wife had a dream. And in the dream, the Bible says she was warned sternly concerning the dude. Your husband is the doer of the most. You better warn him for his sake, yours, and all these little children that are still crawling. And so what did the woman do? She was like, if you say as much as one word again on this case of Jesus, you are done for. And the man was like, is it that serious? She was like, it is that serious. So, Someone can be at peace with you without necessarily liking you. So we need to get our priorities straight. We have work to do and sentiments are not helping. So you may not like the way that I am mentoring you, but I am mentoring you. You understand what I mean? Yeah, I am. Because I have been assigned by the Lord. You understand what I mean? So you need to learn how to put sentiment aside and just continue simply because we have work to do. 
So let me finish my dimension talk, at least my four minutes. You see, what Daniel did was he, he jumped multiple dimensions. And many of us, thank you, appreciate that, need to recognize, so this is the example that I want, that I want to give us. I, I saved it for now. Because it helps us to understand how these dimensions work. Do you know that in the dimension that we're in, animals don't talk? They don't. But there are dimensions where animals talk. I've been to some of those dimensions. You understand what I mean? I've seen animals have conversations as men. But in these dimensions, in these particular dimensions, animals don't talk. There are dimensions that you get to, you, you know, you see, the, uh, how do I explain this? There is something that goes on in the presence of God. In the presence of God, many dimensions come in and go out. The coming and go out is like an orbit. It keeps moving, it keeps moving, it keeps moving. And that is the reason why sometimes you will see two people standing in the presence of God, having conversations, and they're multidimensional. Let me give you an example. When the angel of the Lord was asked to bring the scroll, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, was the only one that could read the scroll, but at that particular point in time, it was in the dimension wherein he appears as a lamb. <laughs> And that was how come a lamb was opening scrolls. But Jesus is a man. Because we were made in his image and in his likeness. You understand what I mean? But there are dimensions that he would be in on a particular day at a given time that is a dimension that is not humanoid. But he still wields all the power. So in a dimension, is a lamb. In another dimension, is a lion. In some other dimensions, is a what? He's a man. A man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Because Jesus told us in Luke 17 that when I come back, I will come back as an eagle. He said it. He says, where the body is, there the eagles will gather. And he was talking about himself and his boys as they come down. So here is the deal. Remember the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. In one dimension, there were children full of fantasies. But the moment they go through the wardrobe, they become people with authority who conversed with animals that did not speak in their dimension. There are certain things that have been revealed to me, not by man, or by creatures that have no business speaking in the dimension that I wake up in. But the fact that I wake up in this dimension doesn't mean I have to stay all day in this dimension. 24 hours is too much to spend in this dimension. That's why people are losing their minds and getting depressed. You were not meant to be here all day. No, no, I'm not. so I told you that I want to give you things that you can start using. Immediately. Jesus was never on earth 24-7. The Bible says in the middle of the night, he will go to the mountain. And when he comes back the next day and he begins to do stuff, and people are like, man, you didn't do that one yesterday. He was like, yeah, that was what my dad did overnight. He says, because the things that I do are the things that I see my father do. So what is the key? I kind of jumped ahead of myself because of time. The key to being multidimensional is the ability to be able to see through the veil. You have to be able to see into that dimension to be able to function in that dimension. Because if you don't see that dimension, you can't even approach it. Can I prove that to you? John chapter 3 verse 3, what did Jesus tell Nico? Jesus says to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot, I think it's 3 verse 4, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 5, he said to him, unless a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You can't enter what you don't see. When the angel of the Lord came, the angels of the Lord, when they came to get Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, they needed Lot and his family to become invincible. 
untouchable. And they saw that the men outside were ferocious beasts who were driven by the adrenaline of sexual lust. And they were so intent on fulfilling their agenda because that was their culture, they would feel like a failure if they do not perform their act. And that was why the entire town was united. What I just said, I said because I want you to understand what's going on politically in the world. A lot of the people that have been positioned politically in the world are, are agents of, of Satan, and that is the reason why they all agree, even when they seem to be acting movies in front of you on the news. You know that there are people that get invited to the Senate to, for questioning, and the person questioning and the one that is being questioned are on the same side, but they'll be asking them questions as though they're asking them tough questions, but nothing comes out of it. The first time the Lord took me in the spirit to see the alliance that was struck before the question and answer session, I saw the thing on television, but I knew something wasn't right. So I stepped back into another dimension and I saw them, how they were shaking hands and practicing their fake questions. Not all of them, I'm, not, I'm just saying. Maybe not all of them, I should say, but the, at least those ones that I saw in particular. They had a deal going and that is the reason why, and you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? He said, you see that whenever this one asks that one a question, it doesn't even give him time to answer, and then he throws in another question. So they just question, 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 no time for answer because they have no answers to give but a lie. And so I say all of that to let you know that there are times when the men of the land will band together to do you harm because that is what they have already proposed in their hearts to do. And they're committed. Why do you need to know that? You need to know that because the only way we are going to achieve our objective is to be committed one to another the same way and be bound by the culture of love for the purpose of glory. Because we'll be looking at the children of this world and they're getting stuff done, but we're here still backbiting and, 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 and what, what, do we, what else do we do? Gossiping and rumors and, and oh, I don't like this person because their church is this and that. Whereas the children of the world are coming together to get things done. But in any case, going back to the story of, of Lot, the angels of the Lord recognized that those people were so intent on fulfilling their agenda and they knew that they were united. And what does the Bible say in Genesis 11? When the people are united and have the same language, there is nothing they have proposed in their heart to do that they will not do. So those angels knew that they could not stop those guys from coming into that room. So what did they do? They changed the coordinates of that room shifted it into another dimension. And that's why the Bible says they struck the men of Sodom and Gomorrah with blindness and they could no longer see the door. Excuse me, how blind can you be? If you have already stood in front of someone's house and you've been trying to force the door open and suddenly you go blind, you know you can trace the door, right? Because when I first read the story, or some of, when I read the story a while ago, I thought to myself, what kind of blindness is this? If men are determined to do something, these houses were not built like our houses. They could have probably kicked down the tent or something. Or maybe trace the thing. All men in the city cannot find one door. That blindness is just a proverbial expression. It's not, the, it's not physical blindness. They shifted that room to another dimension that those guys don't operate in. And so they could not see it and they could not get to it. You cannot enter what you cannot see. So here's my submission to you today as we close and draw the curtains. As we break bread today, I want to encourage you, men and women of God, be who you are in Christ Jesus, a multidimensional being whose eyes are open to see. You need to learn how to have access to different kinds of eyes that are meant for different kinds of dimensions. And the four living creatures who are in the presence of God day and night, they have eyes that you can borrow. So how do you get to that place? Be in God's presence, spend time in his presence. Pray and intercede for others. Speak in tongues often. Study the word of God. I was telling the men on the call on Saturday, on, on Monday, I said one of the ways by which the Lord began to open my eyes was he started with what I had. Some of us want to have prophetic vision, but you have not done anything with your mental imagination. And that imagination, you did not buy it from Costco. 
God gave it to you. And he gave it to you not just so that you can plot evil. He gave it to you so that you can simulate dimensions and be comfortable and be ready. And when heaven sees that you're ready for multiple dimensions, they will send you a transport system. Let me say that again. When heaven sees that you are ready for certain dimensions, they will give you, they will bring you a transport system to that dimension because God wants you to be multidimensional. He just doesn't want you to go and disgrace him there. So he wants you to be ready before they take you. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, he wants you to be, he wants you to have had practice and you use your imagination to practice. When I'm going to have meetings with people, I practice in my imagination what's going to happen when I get there. How I'm going to sign in on the ground floor. Someone's going to walk me to the elevator. I'm going to pose in front of the mirror, do final checks to my makeup. And when they open the door, finally, I pretend as if, oh, like, oh, oh, this is awesome. I'm so glad to be here. Whereas in reality, I'm like, I can't get this thing over fast enough. Let's get out of here. But you practice all those things so that you do not get there and appear as a novice. Now, I know somebody's saying, oh, but Jesus says when they bring you up to speak, do not premeditate what you will speak. No, I'm not premeditating what I will say. I am only rehearsing how I will act. It, there's a difference between what, what things I say comes from the unction of the Holy Spirit, but how I comport myself, that's my business. You understand what I mean? And so you use your imagination to get to places before you get to places. And so when I started studying the Bible as a little child, I will imagine what was, I would imagine how did David learn how to fight lions and bears? I don't think he fought the very first one he saw. He must have run the first time he saw a bear. He, so I imagine those things. And let me tell you something. Like I told you guys on Monday, till now, I still can't tell you the day the transition happened that I went from imagination to prophetic vision. It was so seamless because my imagination was getting better and better and better and better until I got to a point wherein I was able to strike the right chord between what truly happened or what I thought happened. And after a while, they were like, yeah, he's ready. My transport system was prepared so that when I get to that place, I will not misbehave. Let me say this for the benefit of those, you, of those of you who were born in America. Those of us who emigrated here, we practiced being in America before we came here. Because the last thing you want to do is show up and look like you just got off the boat. Because our psyche is people take advantage of people who don't know what they're doing. It's I don't want to appear in America and then be taken advantage of because people are like, <laughs> you just got here. You see that apartment? It's 7000 a week. And if I don't know any better, I'll be like, okay, take the money. No. But because you see me and you don't know that I just got here, you would tell me the real price because you don't want to make a fool of yourself. And that is how we are supposed to operate when it comes to the things of the Spirit. You know that some of us have not even practiced enough what we're going to do when suddenly four or five angels are paying your room and say they just want to hang out. Someone says, I'm going to run out. You know, it's happened to somebody, it happened to Joshua. His mother was interceding and praying. Rosemary had a desire for her son to, to have an angelic visitation. And about two days later, an angel of the Lord visited the boy. He came to our room in his boxers and he was shaking like a leaf in the wind. He, I was like, calm down. He said, he said there was someone in his room. I didn't even know about the arrangement that they had because my wife had prayed and she said, you will see angels. And he begged, he was like, maybe not yet. He hasn't seen, if he's seen anything since then, he's probably the shadow of somebody walking past his room. Because he just wasn't ready. You understand what I mean? So, in conclusion, I'm, let me give you a scripture. Jump with me to Genesis chapter 7 verse 12. And then we're going to use that to break bread. Because I don't want it to be that we, we came to church and we didn't even read even though we've been quoting, praise God. Genesis um, 12, 7, 7, 12. Let's start with 7, 12, 7. Let's see. Um, no, actually. Yeah. What does it say? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, and said. You see, I used to read this thing, and I would just read it. And my focus was on what God said. <laughs> but 
But before God spoke, what did he do? He appeared. There are certain messages that God delivers after you have seen him. <laughs> there are certain things that you would only receive after you can perceive. Because if you don't see, you're not yet in that dimension. And certain messages do not leave certain dimensions. So, let's go back to the first thing I said and we're going to break bread. The first thing I said was we need to learn in this season to read from right to left and from left to right. If God spoke after he appeared, then God can appear after he spoke. Let me say that again slowly. Reading from right to left. Actually, let's start, from, let's start from right to left. From right to left, God appeared. And then he spoke. So you have the word after you saw the appearance. He appeared, you beheld him. So the moment you saw him, you aligned with his dimension. And once you align with his dimension, it takes you into the secret place where the word is. Okay? That is reading from right to left. So if you want to see him and be in the dimension where he is operating and revealing secrets, come to the word. The word came after the appearing. If you read from left, from right to left, that's what you see. The word of God gives you the authority to also practice the same thing from left to right. Anybody who takes the word of God for what it is, the word of the Most High. And you put it in your heart as you should, and you honor it by believing in it. To honor the word of God is not just to sing, it's to truly believe that word. The moment you do so, the Bible says, for as many as have received him, who, which him, the word that became flesh, for as many as have received him, have we given the power to become. So here is the deal. You can be multidimensional by reverse engineering angelic visitations, by reverse engineering even manifestations of your heavenly father himself that you have seen in scripture by just starting with what you already have. You have a word from God, hold on to it until he appears. It is your season to hear things that you have never heard before. But it's only going to come when you go to places that you've never been before. You need to be intentional. You need to be resolute. And you need to learn how to operate the palindrome of the word of God. Reading things from left to right and right to left. If there's a promise that you have seen in the word of God, break it down. And say, well, this is where I want to be. But this is where I'm at. How can I go from here to there? Flip it around. And before you know what's going on, you will be hopping dimensions. Welcome to this new dispensation in the life of Communion House. Welcome to this new season in the body of Christ. We have come to a season of authority, and I am glad to announce it to you. We are not just men, but we are meant to be multidimensional men. In some dimensions, you will be a man. In another dimension, you will roar like a lion. And in other dimensions, you will soar as an eagle. But in all, you will be a blessing to many generations. God bless you, Communion House. I'll see you Saturday. Alrighty, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now that that excitement is over, let's break bread. Alrighty, so let's do this. Um, Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 that we just read holds a very powerful secret that I want us to tap into. God appeared and said, Jesus walked with these disciples on the road to Emmaus and they didn't see him because he hadn't appeared to them yet, even though he was with them. God is with you, Bradley, all the time, but he doesn't always appear to you. You need to learn how to make him reveal himself. And so those disciples, even though Jesus was with them, fulfilling the promise, he said, I would never leave you, nor forsake you. He was with them, but they did not see him for seven miles. 
Again, I told you the reason why. Now you know. If someone sets an exam for you, now you can pass. Why did they not see him? Because he was with them, but from another dimension that they could not see, so they could not access it. So you're sad, but you're, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that same God is there with you. How come I'm not accessing that, that joy, that strength? Because you're not seeing his appearing. And so Jesus broke bread and he gave to them. And the Bible says the moment he gave them the bread, their eyes were open. They saw him, and then he jumped. Again, he left that place. They saw him, he left that place. But the good thing is, the moment they saw him, it wasn't like he stopped being with them. It was just that now that they had come into that dimension, they had come into him and he into them. You understand what I mean? So when we break bread, we have the ability by divine Benevolence to tap into the same grace to see the one that is with you. So as we break bread today, don't just break bread and want to just randomly see Jesus. I want you to do like we did on Saturday. See Jesus doing something in particular. I want you to use the eye of your imagination as you break bread today to see Jesus in a particular situation. Be intentional, be exact. There is an aspect of your life that you want to see Jesus. He says the son of man has the authority to forgive sins. So do you want to see Jesus forgive those that you are finding it difficult to forgive? Because the moment you see Jesus forgive them, it becomes easier for you to forgive them because you are in him and he is in you. But you have to see him. Do you want to see Jesus, the healer? Do you want to see him mend your broken heart? This moment in time is for you not just to receive the body of Jesus, but it is for you to see Jesus in his glory. Shining that light, shining his radiance into the darkness that has plagued your world. Be specific. See him come to you. I want to see him come to me and show me the paths around the foot of the mountain that leads to where the father is waiting in the night. Because Jesus knew where the father was going to be. I want to see him come and take me and show me how to arrive in the place where he appears, that I may see what he's done, that I may hear what he said, so that in my waking hours, I can say what he says and do what he does. That is my desire. Open my eyes, O oh God, that I may see, Lord Jesus, great and mighty things which I do not know. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Praise the Lord. Mamakus mission sion don tum sayalavadia. Sabakus lefrekedis mokund apus makandi ala fumsa. Bablesh lukru kwakis ogum bravadush tili endamande. Hamsike, hamsike, hamsike. Holy Ghost. God is good. Um, I'm going to just say this one more thing. Alan, you can come up to bless the offering. Um, and I just want to encourage us. I want to first of all say thank you for those who have consistently supported the work here. Um, we have very similar expenses to events that sell tickets at the door. We pay for lights and sound and all, all kinds of things and preparations, but we don't take tickets at the door. But those who come to partake of what is being served in here, I believe that if we're doing what we're supposed to do, each and every one who comes to partake of the work will recognize their part in the work so that they can give cheerfully. You see, when you don't see your part in a thing and someone asks you to give, you'll give grudgingly because it's become a necessity. But when you see your part in the thing, you will give 
cheerfully because it's your thing. You understand what I mean? And so thank, thank God for those who have caught the revelation already and for those of us who are still yet to get there, may the Lord quicken your steps unto righteousness in the name of Jesus. But this thing that I want to say as Alan is coming forth is for the benefit of those of us. Ah, thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay. Apparently, um, okay. So some before the rest. So let's, let's do this. Let me just quickly give you this insight. Um, at least this much I'm allowed to tell you. The Lord took me in the spirit and I saw myself in the waiting room and I saw y'all there. And I stood as an instructor preparing you for a tour. I was just telling you, this is what we're going to experience. This is how we need to comport ourselves. This is what we need to expect. And very soon, as soon as that door, those doors open, we're going to go in there and immediately you will know what to do. And so when I told you earlier on that we have come into a new season and that we have to have a different sound and be able to see ourselves in different dimensions is because we need to be ready for where God is taking us. The host of heaven have been prepared to receive us, to give us a tour of power. Okay, that much I can also tell you. It's not just a tour of experiences. Heaven wants to give us a tour of power. We will see the possibilities of what the power of the Holy Spirit is able to do still in the world. Because if we don't see it, we cannot access it. The people who accessed it, who walked in it in the past, saw it. That's the difference between them and us because we haven't seen it. Elijah said to Elisha, if you see, you will have. And so they're about to give us a tour. And I am ready. I pray that you are too. Because once we have seen it, the world will see it in us. Get ready. It's around the corner. God bless you. Alan. Praise the Lord. Ain't you glad you came tonight? God is good. We're not going to prolong it. Oh, come on. Off the chain. Thank you, Brother Gavin, for the offering slides there. Let us be sensitive to the instruction that we have received in our giving, for indeed this is fertile ground. God is good. And while we prepare our offerings, let's just take a moment to give God thanks for what he's done and how he's been dealing with us in this house. Several ways to give, cash app, dollar sign, communion house, PayPal at communion house, as well as Isaiah and online giving information on the screen giving cheerfully as the word declares. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for this evening, O oh God. And thank you for the heavenly expectation, O oh God, that you've brought before us that we may see, O oh God, these wonderful things that you have for us to bring glory to your name to edify the body, to encourage your children worldwide. Father, we give you praise for indeed there is none like you. Lord, take these offerings. Let them be found pleasing in your sight, O oh God. For we know that it is you and you alone that brings increase. You alone give seed to the sower. And so, Father, we thank you that indeed you shall multiply, Lord, what you have placed in our hands. We thank you for communion house, O oh God, and how you grow it, how you sharpen it, and how you're using this body of believers to be a blessing. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you, and we all say it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. God is good. We've been encouraged this night. Don't forget, we'll be back at an Instagram live tomorrow, 9 p.m., pressing into prayer. Let's take what we have received tonight and see more. God is good. We'll see you next week.